This podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners and viewers like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And to stay updated with video releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. I'm Rani Shatah, and this is The Beirut Banyan. Friday night, 10 p.m., not because we want to be here at 10 p.m., but because there's, I think, one hour of dawli. Which is amazing. And I think that was the last switch that went from ishtirak to dawli. So we have maybe an hour or maybe two uh, to talk. And that's probably not enough time to talk about everything that went wrong since we last spoke. The last time we spoke together on the podcast was about Clubhouse. Uh, Yes, and uh, the New Yorker um, article. Right, that's true. Uh, We had... uh, But it's here, actually. Yep, you're right. That was the only occasion, I think, that probably both of us spoke about something that was not Lebanon-related. True. And we made it Lebanon related. And at the time, we had Yimkin only three hours uh, of electricity electricity cuts. Yeah, right. It was still 21 hours. Good times. Exactly. Good times. (laughs) But it's funny, even Clubhouse to me seems like ancient history. And that's just a few months ago. Was it three months ago, maybe, or four? Exactly. Earlier in the summer. So it's just one uh, season earlier. True. And so many things have gone wrong. But forget the last few months. I think it's the last few days, or maybe the last week, since last weekend. It feels like uh, things have, it's now past tense when you talk about something that worked. Uh, the, The bar is so low that we expect things to get worse every day. And then, uh, was it last Sunday morning? You wake up, and I'm guessing in your world, since you're a reporter and you're always on the news and you're focusing in on the news, uh, Sunday morning, one of the most difficult ways to wake up is to tragedy, whether you're reporting or not, but it's that kind of tragedy. Was it more than 20 people were burned to death in Akkar, and not because of, uh, this is an entirely avoidable situation. True. One bullet shot at the, at the gas tank, the truck uh, storage, and 20 people lose their lives and more. And that's just the beginning of a wave of... Of unfortunate events. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wasn't sure how to uh, go back in time without sounding too bleak, but maybe we could start it in a different way. Um, you're a very, very uh, productive reporter. Thank you. <laughs> Thank it, you. It, this is 10 p.m. Was it 9 p.m. that you had, or 8 p.m., a, report, um, a piece that came out? Yes. So that's Friday night. Um, I know you in private and in, in friendship that you're always, always tuned in to what's happening. And uh, I think anyone that's drawn to this story... Uh, they they would stick it they would stick around because that's what you do you're part of the story you're narrating the story it would make no sense to run away from it so you dive right into it but how has it been for you in the last maybe the last few weeks because of the electricity cutouts the internet becoming wobbly at best uh, benzene gas mazout whatever it's hard to drive. It's a luxury to drive. Add to that, just that institutions have failed and uh, you're in a country that has collapsed, and yet you're still on the beat. So how is it for you? In an emotional way, 
psychological way, maybe even your physical well-being. Do you sleep? I know I don't. I barely sleep. I don't. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm talking too much probably because no, no, I'm, like, I'm sleep deprived. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can totally relate. But honestly, lately, like in the way when, you know, whenever I have something to report on or like, you know, my usual life like nowadays, like, because you can't feel like you, you can have a day off because every day there's something that's, you know, worthy of reporting. So it's always like, you know, I need to feel as if I'm a ro like a, a robotic kind of reporter because I just, if I want to tune in to my emotional side, every time I'm reporting, it's not going to be something that's, I'm not going to produce a piece. I know this is, these are a lot of, you know, information that will just like drain you. And already people, you know, whenever they're seeing the news, they're seeing, you know, it's going to get worse. Yeah. So it's even worse when you are the person just telling people it's going to get worse and backing this up with, you know, facts, figures, and just telling them what's going on between politicians. You're just telling them it will get worse. So <laughs> delivering this news on, on itself is something, Yane, that's very, very hicky. It takes a lot of energy from you. And I feel like I'm always this phase of like sad stories. So, uh, but I mean, there's nothing that's hicky. I'm, I can't produce a, a, a happy story at this point because, you know, the situation is like not getting better. So I really need to tune in to this robotic side whenever I'm reporting at this point. And it's very hard. When you say robotic, do you mean it's almost like a numbing experience? Exactly. Or? And like n not to tune into any emotions, because if I'm going to do that and if I'm going to tune into my emotions and report on what's happening, yeah. I'm going to collapse. I know the news is already by itself hmm. too much to absorb. How do you do that? Because, and I'm wondering if this is just, as a reporter, you don't have to get emotionally involved in the story itself but still it's your story I mean you're watching your own life to some degree implode with the story so how do you how do you make it robotic I wish I could do that at times and I don't know how it's a very very hard process especially when you're reporting something about a city that you love so deeply and that you saw when this kind when this city is was actually blooming and you know having the best days of your life in the city and now all at once it's collapsing and like there's all the sectors are just you know collapsing all together people are sad you know it's something that takes a lot of energy from you to actually admit to yourself that everything is collapsing your favorite city is not is no longer the same so it takes a lot of energy from me to actually push out or pull out from this like particular you know emotional side and just report on the news, although it's very hard because the news itself is very heavy. I mean, yeah. looking at the numbers of people who are dying, whether it's an explosion or, you know, just waiting for to uh, to fuel their cars. I mean, it's tragic and it's human made. Like, as you said, it's something that could be really avoidable. So reporting on this, it takes a lot of energy to just pull out of my emotions, but it takes a lot to actually like do that. So uh, I just like take some five minutes per day to just scream and do my thing, tune into my emotional side, and then I go back and work. I'm on my laptop just, you know, trying to get the, the facts straight, trying to see what's going on, calling people, calling experts, calling um, hospitals, let's say, just to get, to get what's happening, to what's, what's going on there. So all of this, like whenever you need to produce something that's really... Um, ethical because you need to have all the right uh, facts and figures you know you, you can't just like have something that's sick on top of your mind so doing that I'm just taking trying to be really you know, I want to say like, objective because I need to have like numbers and just that and seeing what's going on without like in just facts but it's very hard you are a talented reporter and you work for Lorient today and I think uh, when you add all of the uh, reports that come out, all the pieces, by that out outlet alone, you can tell that there's a lot of effort being made that's on the ground and it's, it's continuous. And then when you know of many of these people, some of them are, are friends that I sort of uh, have gotten to know better since I started the podcast. Uh, I think my emotional 
my empathy is so, uh, I'm not sure what the word is, knowing how much effort they're putting in, it, it in a way humbles. And then it, you have one of two choices. You can either try to match that output, or you can maybe retreat further into the corner in sort of an unhealthy way. And I chose the first, which is trying to be as productive as possible. And then there are situations where everything shuts down. Not encouraging, right. Right. So you want to go to a cafe because they might have electricity. They don't. Uh, you're sweating and your laptop is on its last legs. The battery is about to go and you have to send something. And you know that you, won't, you just won't make it. So you go to your phone. We experienced this. We were invited to a podcast. I had to do it from my car. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> We're on the phone because there's no no electricity. It's dark in this in this apartment and we're in my car with the battery on, light the light on, <laughs> wasting fuel for AC. Exactly. There's always this like balance that There's you need. a balance. <laughs> but this balancing act um it's clearly not sustainable. And who knows what will happen in the coming days. There may be a government formed. It, all indications are that something will be formed soon. But the level of uh, dysfunction that we go through now, it's very difficult to see that improving quickly. It'll take lots of time. And it goes maybe to a, a word that I think of often now, which is a crossroads, that we've reached, that we passed an intersection, but the road that we're on now is not the right road. It's the wrong road. Um, is this is this a um, an irreversible thing to you? And I know it's like a bit of a hypothetical, but do you see things going back to something that's balanced, or do you sense that things are getting worse? But and we just adjust as much as you can until it's impossible and you shut down. It depends when are you asking, <laughs> because it really depends on like what happened on this day. Mm. Honestly, like I, I used to be this person that you know, no, I would say we can't like um, plan next year because you never know what happens. But nowadays, you say that you know you can't plan what you're going to do tomorrow because you never know what happens. Right. And honestly, these days, like whenever you're sleeping, okay, if you you're sleep, be plan two hours in advance. Exactly. Sometimes, like, yeah. you know, sometimes when you when you feel like you will get some sleep because you're just super tired. So you know that, you know, the heat won't come in your way. So خلص, you expect that you're going to collapse and just sleep. But then you, you have this like, like thought before you sleep, whether you're going to, to wake up to the same scene in your house, because mm. you never know, like if the building would collapse because of anything that happens in your neighborhood or whatever it is. So there's always this like worst case scenario that we are expecting, yeah. even if you're someone who's very positive, uh, who's very, you know, someone who's uh, saying that, no, okay, it, it could get worse, but uh, no, luckily it's just that and you know, it's going to get better. But these days you're, you know, every time we're, we're experiencing this, you know, happy day or, or let's say a day that ha didn't have any disasters, which yeah. is like a very, you know, it's almost impossible nowadays. But you feel like, uh, no, okay, the next day could be something, you know, could be like a, also, you know, a light day. But, so you, yeah, yeah, but you, I, you can't I, even see this coming, honestly. I don't see, uh, I've not, this is a, one immediate example I can think of. You're talking about exhaustion and collapsing from exhaustion. I think maybe at 11 o'clock last night, so tired. I'm quickly falling asleep because the AC is still on, knowing that it's going to cut out very soon. And then you hear the Israeli jets over, and it's like... I didn't even hear that, by the way. I was right. so right. dead in my sleep. So you're so tired, you don't even hear fighter jets <laughs> exactly. above. Right. But even then, it's, um, you're reminded nothing is normal. Exactly. You just don't know what you're going to wake up to. Like, even if you're going to sleep for just 10 minutes or a nap, literally, you don't know if you're going to wake yeah. up to the same scene. But that's, um, that's the crossroads that I think of, though, is that we passed what could have been a reflection of normality into something that's completely abnormal. And if you don't mind, I'm going to try to take this step by step, and I'd love your thoughts on this. 
I can't think of one thing today that functions the way it should. <clears throat> Our gas comes from the black market. I'll let it be known that there are two gallons of gas in my name <laughs> Coming up soon. waiting yeah, to <laughs> fill up what could be half a tank at the black market rate. That's only to be able to move around the city for the next few days. And just in, in case of emergency, because honestly, this right. is also like something that we are planning. Exactly. You know. <laughs> so it's a last minute decision in case there's errands to run in the next several days. None of them are planned. It's like a, it's just a backup. Uh, but that's abnormal. The black market delivery of, few, of gas to your car. Electricity, other than this magical hour exactly. or whatever, it's all black market. It's generator fuel. It's generators, which are by default the black market. But we've been living in that black market as far back as I can remember. I, I know I, my whole life in this country has been, there's been the generator uh, expense. That's black market. But we grew accustomed to it. Um, I don't know if this is a form of black market, but now the basics you sometimes need to have it's not black market, but it's the it's the wrong market. You need people from abroad to send you uh, medicine. Medicine. Oh. I have friends that bring me basic medicine, emodium, from abroad, knowing that I can't get it here now. Which, I asked a friend to get me lenses, which is like something that should right. be, you know, in abundance at least. <laughs> Our currency is the wrong. I mean, if you, I don't know if this black market anymore, but. The Lawler doesn't make sense. And the different terminologies, and yeah. Lawlers yeah. and among other... <laughs> Illegal haircut. Bad, it's the wrong financial, uh, the wrong finance. The numbers don't match. I, my mind is, for some reason, not going to the rest now, but... Education sector, Education hospital sector, sector all of yeah. them are collapsing. And no, but like even, in a, I mean, you can now pay for a vaccine and bribe your way into getting a vaccine rather than waiting for the next uh, marathon. I think most things now are functioning the wrong way. The regime is a black market regime. That's not a regime that governs. That's a regime that plunders. Now, go a step further. Uh, Criminals are in control. Innocents are deemed criminal and are interrogated. Um, Can I build on that? But I'll, I'll say one more <laughs> and then I'll let you build up. Our fuel may be coming from a militia because the militia wants to be a bit more persuasive these days. I mean, that's, it's rotten to its core. So I'll stop that list and I'll let you, uh, well, I interrupted you. No, Sorry. no, no, but I, I just wanted to uh, build on the, the aspect where you're saying we have criminals and they're like, you know, just out there and having their normal lives while we're literally like collapsing. If it's not like something that, if we're not really dead, we are slowly, you know, just dying or exper we're not experiencing life as we should be. Um, like speaking of that, uh, I had to uh, cover two parliamentary sessions in the past three weeks. And one of them was just this afternoon, right? Exactly. Yeah. One yeah. of them was today. So you'd see people, like on the first one, it was uh, when they were voting for the uh, immunity lift. Yes. They wanted to pass this law so be, or not pass. Uh, so basically what uh, they've done during this session is that you would see the protesters, you know, just like right, right across the street, uh, mothers who lost their daughters or sons like during the, the August 4th and they're crying their hearts out or families, you know, or friends had that they were protesting and, you know, just crying and demanding uh, like uh, justice. And they're just in the most miserable state ever. And then you'd go and see what's going on in the parliament and they're so chill and they have like a very, you know, uh, decent environment because they have AC, of course. I'll remove this if you're not comfortable, but could you describe it the way you described it before we started recording? Exactly what you saw. You don't, if, you don't, if you don't want to name them, don't name them, but 
the, just the uh, the physical characteristics that you witnessed. You mentioned one person in particular that found his way to almost take a nap. Exactly. And one of them just, you know, just was, was super bored that he had to change his, like the way he's sitting for like five times. And I had my eyes on him because I was like, this is not real. You know, people outside are dying and he's almost asleep and he's not interested. And even like voicing an opinion, which we're not going to hear and we're not going to take, but, you know, you are an authority figure who mm -hmm. can actually do something in case they had like, you know, the will, but they're sitting and it's just at one point, all they said was a poem, was a, like a part of a poem. And because they both, like, you know, it, it, ha it happened that two people knew the same poem, so they just recited it together. Because it, that's fun when people are dying, because that's the right choice. So it's TikTok at the parliament. It's TikTok, yeah. but like real life show. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, the balance is striking here. A lot of people are, you know, doomed. And a lot of people are just not tuned into what's happening on the ground. Which is very weird, because... I mean, when, when they get from their houses to the parliament, are they, are, are they not looking at the street? Are they not seeing the queue on the fuel station? No. There's something that's missing here. Are they just looking at their phones or on the ground not to see? The, you know, is this intentional? So that's where you, you feel puzzled because these are the only people who can, you know, if they had the will again, to change something, they can. It's too late, but they can in a year and a few weeks now of a caretaker government. And uh, we've seen what that we've seen what that does when things are already bad. That when you have paralysis plus almost like a hands off policy that's not our business anymore. You see how a country can just degenerate into low level anarchy and social unrest. And uh, in some ways, a social explosion. And we've seen violence at gas stations. We've seen violence in many places. We've seen what negligence and violence can do. And we've also seen uh, what looks like, uh, in many ways, a country that is ungovernable, but not at war. And the reason I'm taking it this direction is it seems like that issue is not on the horizon. That we're not going to see social strife in a way that's reflective of the war years. But everything else is experienced. So the pain and the suffering and the, un the inability to do anything about it, and the tension on the streets, and the maybe a lighter example, the private generators that are now everywhere, the, uh, the fighting over things that you didn't have to fight over before, the bread lines, the uh, people taking justice into their own hands to survive and also maybe at times to resort to crime. Exactly. Or to take advantage of like the situation. Right. I don't know how a society recovers from that without it going through a long healing process that may not always be great. That's how I grew up. That's the post-war environment. It's not, it's not rosy. Of course. Uh, it's going to take a long time. Yani. Even in terms of numbers, it's going to take a, lo a long time. Do you worry about war? The I, and I'm sorry to take it back here, but I've put that on the shelf. I just don't see it happening. Because what, what we're experiencing is like if something that's even worse because, you know, at war... Worse than war? Yes. What do you mean by that? The feeling, you know, yani, you know that you're experiencing the worst thing, but you still need to go to work, let's say. You still, you know, there's, there's, you still have this routine, but in a way that you have less means mm. to do it. <laughs> yeah. Which is honestly, it's, it's like a, you're killing pe your own people with like a slow death, which yeah. is even worse in my opinion. Um, but I just wanted to highlight something. Like for me, my own, let's say, remedy out of all of the things that are happening, whenever I see how much the civil society is actually like this sympathy that we have for each other, even like... If I don't have the means to, let's say, um, 
you know, get medicine for a certain person because it costs a lot or I can't afford it or you know, either I can't afford it or I can't find it here. Yeah. A lot of people are actually trying to do something, find a way, ask a stranger. A lot of people are trying to find a solution for other people, like even if they have their own problems. So, I mean, honestly, seeing this on ground just is, is such a nice move. And um, I would... Sorry. But that's like survival, right? Shared burden. I mean, drink. yes, but, uh, you know, I, I really like to highlight and like, you know, just put a magnifying glass at how much the civil society is helping because this is the only good thing that's happening. Mm -hmm. I agree. And can I just build on that? Of course, of course. Um, so I was writing an article about... The reason you I'm know, talking too much is because I've slept, I think, four to six hours every night the last two weeks. Me too. So <laughs> maybe even a little longer than that, actually. <laughs> So my rhythm is a bit off. No, no, so no, I, no. I've been interrupting, I think, <laughs> regularly. I apologize. No, no, no. You're not at all. But, um, so I was uh, covering... Uh, no, no, I everyone, was writing... Everyone fell asleep. <laughs> already. <laughs> um, I was writing an article about the education sector. And I was talking to a lot of people who, you know, don't have the means to buy a laptop for their uh, children nowadays because of the situation. Or they don't have electricity. So in case the school year is going to be online, it's going to be... A disaster for a lot of uh, people and even if it's going to be in person it's going to be a disaster because mm -hmm. not a lot of teachers are going are going to be able to go to the school and not a lot of uh, students and the financial burden which you know uh, some people can't afford even buying uh, books uh, to, to even begin with yeah. so um, seeing all of that on one hand is very depressing because education sector is the most essential in my opinion for this country at this point but like in you wrote an article about that. I'm going to link it to the episode. Thank you. You actually wrote a very... <laughs> Pushing for the house. Oh, oh <laughs> no. is that... No, no, you know, no. It's an in-depth in -depth look at what the failure of that sector can do to a society. So I'll, I'll link it to the episode. Thank you. <laughs> so basically the failure of this like sector is very depressing. But on the other hand, there are a lot of organizations or people like just, you know, trying to say if anyone needs... Um, a private tutoring, we're, we're, we're able to do it for free, we can come over. We, a lot of people are actually pushing for that and they don't want the education sector to die. But regardless of this, a lot of people are trying to help within all sectors. So honestly, yeah. having you know, a look into all of these people who are trying to help, whether it's uh, morally or physically or <laughs> in whatever means, it's such a nice and, you know, it's... Um, it's a heartwarming initiative from, from their end. It is heartwarming. And it shows that the human, human capacity is so, so fast that even when this stuff is happening, there are, there are really... That is a positive side to the story. People still help each other. But it, it's so bleak. And I think you said it was before we started recording that even those that are still able to offer help are suffering immensely. So it's not like there's a, you mentioned, I think, classes of society that were all, every class of society, or for the most part, is, uh, is experiencing this, is experiencing real pain and a pain that is persistent. I agree with you. It's not that this is just an ongoing tragedy with bleak news only and sadness and despair there are also these other sides multiple sides maybe to the story that are not always bleak some of them are actually only positive one example aside from the one you just gave is the sheer determination of some people which is profound it's uh it's inspirational keep trying when you know that you may well lose but you keep trying nonetheless and I think that, it, that uh, it's not naive or foolish. That's just, that's, uh, it takes guts to go all the way with something when all the odds are stacked against you. Even politicians are doing that. <laughs> well, I was actually referring more to no, the... No, no, no. Was, was, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> Didn't think of it that way. It's well said. But I was, well, let's go first to the <laughs> protesters that would like to be politicians the right way. Um, they're still trying, which is quite remarkable. I, I don't know 
whether or not they really think change will come if they show up in parliament or if they form an opposition. They may not have to join the government. They could just be in opposition within. But uh, whether or not they genuinely think that change will come there, I think is maybe up for debate. But the fact is they're still trying to do the right thing. I think that's quite remarkable. Exactly. And honestly, a lot of uh, like people f from the you know, 2019 uh, protests don't want to be politicians, but they mm -hmm. want to be part of the civil society that's helping. Um, let's well, take they, for an they example. They don't want to be politicians. I mean, be maybe part, part of them, yes. But mm. you know, there's a huge group that doesn't have this interest, but they want to be part of the opposition in terms of being vocal, in terms of, you know, just uh, amplifying their help and their, the support they can give. And um, I know there's this uh, Baitna Baitak initiative yes. that's actually initiated from, uh, like, protesters that who were, mm -hmm. you know, just looking on what's happening on the ground. And I think it initiated from the August 4th blast. Yes. Um, even when, you know, they're always trying to do something that's helpful. And on the other hand, they're just trying to inform people on what's going on yeah. and, you know, just uh, warn of further, uh, I know, something that would be uh, not found in Lebanon. So, you know, they give them like a certain hickey announcement. And I love what they're doing. They're doing, you know, there are a lot of young people on the ground just trying to help. And you know they don't. They're not even considering an, a, to be a politician or a politics. It's not even on their agenda. Some of them, of course, many of them you know, want to be maybe part of this. But I know that a lot of people don't want to be part of this. But they want to be involved in terms of you know supporting and helping. That whole October 17 crowd, which you're describing, from the protester to civil society to the up and coming, or even the politically minded. I think they all share that uh, that spirit, and that's a spirit maybe that never dies. Maybe that's something that you just can't ever uh, completely erase. But uh, even there, when it's that's the kind of um, that's the maybe that word is still here. It's the hope, maybe. But um, I see something so structural in the way that uh, spells disaster, and we're in it. And I'd like to pick your brain on this, even though it's something you don't necessarily, um, it's not something maybe you write about regularly or cover directly. But uh, it's, uh, it's something that I think is just too, it's too deep, it's too entrenched. Um, I can't, uh, I just can't, I imagine one of two scenarios. Uh, one is we, uh, we end up in low-level anarchy with a state that resembles what we have, that uh, adheres exclusively to Iran's needs, whether that's security, whether that's uh, regional influence, or if you want to use this foreign policy, I don't know what, I don't think this is foreign policy, it's almost like, more like foreign uh, backed implosion but let's say that that to me is one option the other option and I know it may it almost sounds like far-fetched when I say it but I think it's real um, a Russian backed Syrian regime with or without Assad uh, is the instrument to cool the temperature down on Lebanon as Iran steps back we get something that is reminding that reminds us of the 90s. Now, there's probably other options available, and many things could happen. But I see these two roads as the most uh, most plausible. And in those options, it's a it's a country that is not Lebanon. It's a it's a very it's a very different experience. And we're stepping away a bit, but. Let me push on this, and I'd like to know whether or not you think that is happening. If you think I'm, if I've lost my mind when I say these mm -hmm. things, because the reason I say this and I ask you is because I don't think this is an opinion shared by many that think about this country. I don't think it's a widespread view. 
I think it's still maybe on the margins, this thought that Lebanon could end up in Syria's orbit again. Not a shot, but a different Syrian orbit that is as bad for Lebanon as it used to be. Or this. So maybe I can ask it in a better way. Do you think October 17, what it resembles now, what it is today, is that third option still, that it has what it takes to counter that? Or am I, am I misreading everything? I mean, of course, in an international community and international politics is like the dominant answer, unfortunately. You know, it's always something that will, you know, take place in Lebanon. But I really feel like there's this, I mean, maybe I'm being too like, you know, rainbows and butterflies when it comes to this, but maybe it's something that I always push for in my thoughts and why I, I still love to cover from Lebanon and just be here. I really feel like the October 17 movement, in terms of ideas and thoughts and people who actually, like, at least part of them who, wants, who want to be politicians, they are really in it because they have the means and, you know, the means in terms of thoughts expertise um, and just the right will and just the right thoughts and there are people who suffered so they don't they know exactly how they it feels like when you're suffering from all aspects especially from the youth because you feel like you mean like we don't have better days coming up soon <laughs> so you feel puzzled so they they feel like they want to do something they want to implement something so I really feel like this could be something. I mean, I don't know how to foresee what's co what's going to come come up next because honestly, it's been a weird scenario and we just couldn't like predict anything that's coming up next even if it's, if it, if you're going to look at it from like an international aspect, we couldn't predict anything that that happened already. What do you mean? Like we we never saw what what has happened. We never saw it coming. Does that include that issue? Meaning yes. that so 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 you never imagined a situation where this country would remain a very important geography for not this part. Mm. And this is you know consider this like a given. you have it. You have mm -hmm. this fundamental mm -hmm. base. Yeah. Where we know that you know the, the geopolitics you know, around Lebanon and Lebanon you know plays a huge role for yeah. you know to to do this and you know, seeing. Mm. But at the same time, we never know, you know what's going to happen next. And everything that's, that happened the last two years in foreign politics is not predictable. Really? I, I, I know that I don't have, uh, I can't predict the future, but I'm pretty sure that this was very straightforward, that there's no chance in hell this issue would move. Um, in other words... Hezbollah was going to crack down on October 17 at some point. Of course, that, not this part. I'm, you know, not, let's not the, look at not the port blast. Nobody okay. can imagine that. Of course. But the consequences of this issue and how it manifests itself, I think we all expected to. There's going to be collateral to being involved in the war in Syria. But we never imagined the form. Right. Okay. Yeah. So everything that shaped up the like, way it's like shaped we couldn't have imagined Nabati uprising against Hezbollah. We could also never That's imagine the other side as well and how far things. Were. Yeah. Honestly, yeah, yeah. you know, when I see the news, like when I see such news, it's I still feel shocked. Yeah. And surprised. Yeah. And you feel like, you know, we didn't see that this one coming. Right. How's your, uh, like, you know, how's your reaction when you see it? I mean, it's, it's still something that's, you know, that's not usual and that's not common. And that's not, you know, you never saw it coming. I think I saw reluctance to go down that, reluctance to address that issue for years. I didn't imagine it being avoided again now. I thought that now this would be the time that it comes up and it's dealt with um, because you cannot get October 17 into power otherwise. True. You say true confidently, though, and this is something I appreciate, but I'm going to challenge you here because 
I know that you believe this. I know because we've had this conversation. But why do you think that this is still a stubborn, uh, divisive, polarizing sometimes, to a degree, uh, subject among October 17? Let me ask it actually in a bigger way. Hezbollah comes up even until today. It's a divisive issue, even until today. Um, the August 4 anniversary protests, I was there for at least maybe four hours. And maybe that's because social media is not the place to go to sort of look at how to read how people interpret a situation. But I saw shallow analysis among people that should know better, describing it as an old, outdated, uh, uglier March 14 protest movement that should look different. It was so condescending because there were people saying they don't want Iranian interference in Lebanon. But that is a polarizing issue. Or, I'll take it from the other side, it's not the same thing, but that you bring up Sami Jmeid and the protest conglomerate, then you have a divided protest movement again. Communists can't stand Sami Jmeid. Go further. Hezbollah sends rockets into Shaba, provoking, but calculating at the same time, no immediate Israeli invasion, but able to get away with a few rockets into empty patches. Those are rockets. That's a rocket. That's a launch pad. That's a convoy that's armed. It's not easy to do that. Thugs in Jamezi that are wit partisans beat up protesters, anarchist-like protesters, and suddenly they're the militia, not Hezbollah. And I get lost in this world. Now, maybe it's because I'm too deep into the mess. In particular, it may be social media, mostly, but I don't think it's just social media. I think this is a real uh, division. You're somebody who for the most part, I think, not entirely, but there's a chunk of this that you agree with. And I'm wondering why not more people are able to just stop doing these false equivalencies, or for that matter, stop offering a false version of reality and rather stick to the facts. All I, right. And I, I'm not saying this out of sleep deprivation. It's something <laughs> I, I really believe, but... As time passes, it feels like there's a, an idea, it's, an, it's ideological as opposed to analytical. All right, so <laughs> I see this in like two different ways. This is where I lose my fans always <laughs> too. So this is how I know that numbers go down when I go down this road. But I, I really want to know. No, but it's like, uh, usually I don't like voice my opinion when it comes to politics, you know, because I just don't see like it's going to go anywhere. But I'll start with you the fight. You just found a way to throw away everything I do. No, 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 but actually, no, 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 but as they, <laughs> you know, no, no, but well on a personal said. level, no, 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 but, yeah. but let's say, <laughs> no, 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 but I know, you know, I, I always discuss it like, you know, with you at least, you know, on one, I'll start with the part where I disagree and then I'll, sure. uh, yeah. I'll highlight the part where I agree. Like, personally, I don't oh, can like Can I add to one more thing and then I'll shut up? <laughs> and I apologize for doing this too much. Hassan Nasrallah and Dorothy Shea are not the same actors in Lebanon. They're not two ambassadors from different countries offering electricity via mazout from an oil tanker or whatever, or electrical supply from Jordan via the World Bank, circumventing sanctions to make sure it can cross Syria and not end up in a, in a mess. They're not the same person. They're not the same actor. They have different intention. And it's impossible to digest that these are two devils giving you bad options. One is typical state procedure, including the World Bank, and diplomacy, and politics. The other one is proxy, and militia, and war, and persuasion in the most sub-state uh, way. That this is where I think, and it's not, these are not pro-Hezbollah. These are, not, these are not Hezbollah supporters or 
anti whatever. These are just it's analysis from I I would expect voices that would get it right, not 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 this false comparison, this balancing act where you have to accuse both sides in order to offer an opinion. So now I will shut up. <laughs> La Ali can go on. Um, we agreed this a, would be a bit of a rugged episode. So here's my rugged take. Yeah, but to, okay, I'll start with the Hickey. One of the parts that I really want to highlight, and no, the part where I disagree. <laughs> and no, I really feel like whenever we say we put this volume of yeah, violence is violence. And no, you can't just you know, like you know, try to see the balance or which equation is you know. Which not which side has more violence? And for me, it's like you know, it's equivalent. So whether it's you know, an airstrikes or s- someone slapping the other, I know it could be like something that's weird for you. But know for me, when I see violence, it's it's a one equation. You know, I generalize when it comes to this particular aspect. Um, so that's why Hike, I wouldn't maybe you know the the voices who are saying that uh, you know the LF are. A militia, but they're like disregarding what Hezbollah is doing. Maybe they're just afraid of actually voicing. And this is exactly what we always forget that a lot of people who are attacking even minister's house or a member of, of the parliament's house, and they usually try to avoid um, people from uh, Amal or Hezbollah because they know that this will clash even harder on them. So they avoid this. So that, that is fear. I mean, it, partially, it's fear. Partially, okay. of course, fear. No, but for me, for for instance, when it comes to my own beliefs, I yeah. really feel like you you can't just you know give a volume to a certain side and you know just say that they are militia, but these are not because they are practicing with other. Maybe they don't have the same means. But I know this is like something that like it's a hickey. It's a weird equation for you, but this is this is the way I see it. You know. When, when it's violence, but in different means, it's the same thing. In different forms, targeting other people. But regardless of this, Anna, I feel like everyone is a militia at this point. It's not, I know that there is like, you know, I don't want to put the certain hierarchy because if you are like on one table with, you know, Oh, I always tell you this, and no, if you're putting ha- hand in hand and just like you know letting this party take place, and you know that they are taking place and they're dominant, and you're letting them be dominant, then you're part of this. Because you're patient with me in general, I'm not going to go too far down this road. But I want to go just a few steps in. I can't disagree more. But I know this is uh, I know this is something that it's not. Uh, I know we you know we're always talking about this. I know, but this is but I agree with you and it no. Can I? Can I, I agree I, with you that yeah. they are the elephant in the room. This is something that we can totally agree on. I think. Uh, um, <laughs> they're not all militia. That's the thing. That's the thing. Uh, but can, can I say something here? I didn't see any militiamen in Jamezi uh, attacking protesters. What I saw was thugs. I didn't see them with my own eyes, although I was there a few minutes. We were all there. We all. What I the video footage was was crime, sectarian slurs, violence. Honestly, I never commented on this particular video because I never. I you know we don't know the whole story. So I don't feel like it's... We don't know the whole story, but at least what we saw was the Lebanese forces partisans that beat up and scared their opponents looked too much like the civil war. Looking like the civil war is one thing. Calling the Lebanese forces a militia is bogus. Fine, but it, you know, you, we can't just like you know disagree on a terminology that we are giving. I know that it, it you know, there's a whole perception behind it, but sometimes you just need to to agree that it's a disarm militia. All right. Thirty-one years ago was the last time they were a militia. But they were. They were. Okay, but you know, I mean, but for such a big definition of. 
tag, you can't just like, you know, you know, remove it and just forget about it. In my opinion, again, that's, that's, that's the thing that I always end up in disagreements with. It's there. It's the tag. Um, how about, I'm trying to find a way to frame it that would make, that would maybe find some more commonality. They're not innocent. It's not that this party is innocent of crimes committed. And clearly, they're not the only ones that did this during the Civil War. So that's obvious. We know that. It's not like this is one group that was... And, and they were. The name is not Astika Lebanon. It's Uwit. <laughs> it's the Lebanese forces. So we know what they used to be. I mean, otherwise they wouldn't be called the Lebanese forces. But aren't they reinforcing this by keeping the name? Branding is terrible. And you know what? I would go a step further. Maybe even Kate'ev, it's time that they improved their name. Maybe. They want, they, they had like a certain... Just because I get a little distracted when I see your Instagram notifications. It makes me feel like I have no friends and you're getting notified every... Okay, so there's... Calling themselves something is, and maybe it's a worse decision, is to not let go of your Civil War badge when you're trying to reemerge as a political party. But that's all true. It's nothing to do with them being a militia right now. I don't, I don't know of any information showing that this is a leadership who's arming his men readying themselves for a civil war. I think the contrary. All indications show that they are looking away from that completely. I don't see you thuggery as militia. Why is this such a heated debate, though? Is it easier just to accuse them all of being militia, therefore you don't have to talk about Hezbollah? I mean, as long as you include them in one plate, at least. But that's one thing. But again, from my perspective, whenever I, you know, I don't like to define them by volume or by means or by weapons or what, whatever means they have. But you asked me once. Again, I'm divulging a bit too much, but I think it's fine because it ropes in. We, you didn't. It's not that you asked me. We talked about degrees of corruption. And some degrees, there are certain levels of corruption that are very particular to certain individuals that make others look like their Mother Teresa in comparison. But I hate this. No, no, I hate that we normalize comparing the level. Like, you know, if, for instance, if, if we see like someone that has, you know, a lower amount of corruption that we, we happen to find out, then this is like the more innocent person. So we can, you know, just forgive him. You know, forgive. it's not forgive, but say putting this aside and not labeling. But you know, can I say one more thing? Of like course, another thing, course. you know, just to add to that. Because there you was know, the really other thing too that we forgot. Exactly. Yeah. So you know, yeah. coming and labeling like the, each group as something won't get us anywhere. You know, we always stop at this, like you know, if it's a militia or not. Of course it is, but you know, okay, where do we take this further? How do we deal with this? It's not about labeling this group as such or this group. It's not about that. I know, you know there's a, again, I know that, that there's like a huge perception behind it, but I don't think it, this is the, the main um, thing to highlight. About Hezbollah? Hezbollah and Lebanese forces. You know, whether it's this or that, whether they're militia or not mil a militia, that's not the thing that we need to see. You know, we need to see how to actually get rid of them. That's the Masa. problem with Hezbollah is that they are militia. If they weren't a militia, They'd be as they'd be as unimpressive as the Lebanese forces today. I'm not denying, but I'm just saying that you know why are we stopping at this particular like you know discussion? Like right. I, I, you know what I mean? It's not about us, but I'm, I'm saying you know in general. Yeah. There's always this debate where it's not you know there there should be something that's more concrete. It's because a militia can kill, and violence is one thing. Murder is something else. Because people are not denying that. They're not denying that, but you, but, but a militia can kill a country, and kill political aspirations. 
uh, thugs and corrupt uh, idiots or ex-militiamen turned, whatever you want to call them right now, these political parties that are past their prime, uh, can be held to account in different ways and can be held more to account when there's less violence. A militia that is able to do more damage than the state is strikingly more detrimental than a non-militia a la Lebanese forces. I, you know, I, I, no, no, but I, it's this disagreement. I guess it goes down to why people felt the need to say killon yani killon. It's because that's the only avenue to accuse them all of being part of the problem while deliberately avoiding the central component to that problem. Or adding it in the same plate, on the same plate, and you know, you're forgetting that. For me, for instance, when I say kelon, yani kelon, it's you no know, Hezbollah is obviously a big part of this. But I don't want to give this like, you know, just like an avoid. It happened that they're a big part of this because they have the weapons, the means, the international, uh, the Iran help and support with everything that they could, you know, need. But they're in the same plate. That's why it's killon, yani killon. You know, we're not going to do a division and, you know, just, you know, we just don't want all of this, all of these parties. We're not just going to take one party and, okay, we're not, we're going to deal with all of them, like, you know, we, we still need them, you know, to, to govern. I don't know if they all share the same burden. I think all of them have contributed in different ways to a bigger problem. A bigger problem that Hezbollah represents, and a bigger problem that precedes Hezbollah, and a bigger problem that has made this country unrecognizable. But I don't know if they're all on the same plate. And I don't know even know if that's Lebanon anymore. I think it's a deranged, proxy-led, shattered thing that we all call Lebanon. I, I don't know. I think because, uh, in my opinion, again, yeah, I feel like you know all of these parties. What and you, you said what? It's bad when <laughs> it's 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 like a you look for. I wonder if this issue would be easier to, to talk about in any other context, but because it's the Lebanese context, it becomes complicated. Of course, you know, in any other country. I would like respect anyone who, you know, is committed to a certain political party because this is part of democracy. You know, you just mm, yeah. go and vote or um, <laughs> you can support vocally uh, yeah. a, 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 like a specific political party. But in Lebanon, I, I have no respect for people who still follow any political party. And I just feel like this is not what you should be doing, you know. So, but this, you know, part of me is saying that this is not democracy then. But honestly... At this point, they're not giving us democracy. And we're not living in like a normal state for us to have this democracy and, you know, support a certain party. Because usually parties in general, political parties, you know, they have this one uh, end goal, end result, to make their country better and, you know, uh, evolve in economically or yeah. in the education sector or whatever. They have the same... End result. They mm -hmm. want to reach the same target, but in different ways. Yeah. But in Lebanon, I feel like every party has a different end result, right. and this is where we are shattered. And as long as they are here, we, we, and they're going to pull out the same narrative to get people to their side. Doesn't that deliberately ignore everything that's happened to this country since the Syrians left? One side didn't play by the rules one side changed the whole definition of what it means to govern this country. It preserved the Syrian regime's role, made it theirs. It didn't allow anyone to govern until their concerns were met 
And that was done through violence. Doesn't that also deliberately ignore May 2008? What it meant when you fire somebody for being, I would say, a traitor, that you get a civil war as a return gift. <laughs> near civil war that Hezbollah also calls the future toy guns on the streets of Hamra a militia. You know, if it was a militia, it would have had a chance. We'd still be talking about it. Instead, we laugh at it. It's toy guns compared to Hezbollah. Doesn't that also ignore... I mean, people are too quick, I think, to hate March 14 because of its failure, it's political failure, but I think it's also safe to say the reason it failed is because it was killed. It's not failing because it was voted out, it was voted in twice. And in that process, repeatedly executed. That's not politics. That's not even parliamentary politics. That's, that's war. So that's why I, I don't know if that can be ignored. It goes into something that I've been thinking through recently. And I, something we've not discussed, but I'd like to know what you think. Is it even, is it even okay to call Lebanon a country right now, rather than a war zone? It's a war zone, but like an indirect one. An indirect war zone. Can you expect much to happen on the reform side when there's a war zone? <laughs> Can I throw an example here? Um, I get into these senseless disagreements. Sometimes they're among diplomats who still still say, to this day they'll say uh, it's negligence and corruption and that's why the port explosion happened. And I know you believe that too. <laughs> negligence is not how 2,700 tons of war-grade ammonium nitrate shows up in a city's if you're a war zone, and if you're playing host to international terrorism, and if you have businessmen with ties to a horrible regime, and a few hundred of those, a few hundred tons of those war-grade ammonium nitrate is left behind, you're only focusing on why it was left behind. You're not even focusing on why it came. That to me. It's missing the story completely. A lot of people are asking this question. But the thing is, okay, we're looking into how did it come here. But there are a lot of authorities and politicians who knew that, let's say, okay, let's say, you no, know, they didn't know that this is happening. All right? But they know that it could be like, you know, there's a dominant, you know, element playing them around as if they're just marionettes but they are st still in charge. And they didn't mind, you know, staying and looking at the situation as is. I'm not saying they're part of this, which of course they could be, but you know, let's take the other scenario where they're not the corrupt ones and they, they are the, you know, they just didn't know that this happened or whatever, but they are the ones who just, like they were told to turn their faces and not like, you know, say anything about it. The resign. Of course. You know, of course. Being a part of this and knowing all of this that's happening and you're still in charge and you're just, you know, a silent uh, person about it. Honestly, you're part of this. You're in the same equation. That's my point. And that's why we say it is corruption because you are turning your head into, you know, you, you saw something and I know that there could be a threat or whatever, threat to actually say, resign. Don't put this authority, this, um, like all of this uh, you know, weight on you. you know, you're part of this during the same year, let's say that you know, uh, the ship came in. You're just there. And you knew that this is happening and you're just you know, silent about it. I completely agree with you. And that's what principled people do. Not collateral damage to a war zone pretending to be a politician. I completely agree with I you. I don't think resigning is going to you know, change uh, a lot of things in, their, in the war spares, zone. <laughs> it spares them, at least, 
the added accusation. I completely agree with you. But then you would agree that it doesn't stop there. It's not that a prime minister at the time or the prime minister since are the reasons why we get ammonium nitrate. They're not making those calls. It's not, it's not even their delivery. It's a war zone. If I killed someone in front of you, okay, you saw this happening, would you be able to just, you know, know go ahead to go out? To, the next not. day, it's a normal day. Of course not. You wouldn't tell anyone, let's say. No, I would not be able to do that. Even if I threatened you. A threat to turn away from a murder is something I think I would... Yeah, I would, what would you I would do? deal with the consequences of the threat. I don't think I can turn away from murder. Thank you. But that's... Oh, so we agree. You can't turn away from the murder. Right. You, yeah, you're not going to sleep at night if you're, you know, just... No. Of course not. Thank you. So let's accuse the murderers too. Not, okay, but, not but this is where you... But this is the hierarchy you start... If you want to, to talk about hierarchy, come in, these are the people that you can actually target mm. and you know and then you can have this domino effect but we can't and you know, it's not that if you remove that you can get that it's both of them no. you know, if, if if i'm not if i'm going to get Hassan these people Dia, Hassan Dia would not exist without Hezbollah Saad Hariri exactly his fifth exactly round. that's his fifth why round. that's why yes. we should get rid of, them, rid of the other part of the equation too and Mish, it's not just this side. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. That's going back to agreement. That's interesting. We went back to agreement. Exactly. No, there, there should be a fundamental uh, base that we agree about. You know, we can uh, have different... <laughs> as long as it's 50-50, I'm fine. I can live with the 50-50. But maybe we're agreeing that at the end of the day, we just want this country to be okay. We oh. just don't want, you know, more... Uh, we don't want more murderers in Yana and you know, literally in uh, unfortunate events. That's why we agree on that. No, no, that's why, we're, one... that, that's, why we, that's why we're friends. I like the idea of living in a normal country. That word is not bad. An unhealthy word. It's the right word. A normal country. Where the wrongs are not considered right. Where crime is not accepted as politics. And where uh, people with ambition can succeed. And the basics return in a way that's suitable to everybody. I mean, very, very uh, minimum criteria to have a functioning system. Um, I'm going to go into something else now. Before we go back into what's happening now. Uh, at this point, do you think the system is sal salvageable? Meaning... The way that we govern will remain the way it is. Not, not a, um, in other words, reforming it rather than overthrowing it. Not the characters, not the names, but the, the system itself. And the reason I ask is I don't know where the protest movement is now on this, what was more revolutionary, which was a civil state, right? Not, civil state as in a, radically different state, a secular state, where the, the way we've governed is gone. And you just have merit-based meritocracy, I guess that's the word. Um, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I, I feel like it's, a, it's going to be a long shot to say, you know, we want everything to be changed now, because we never practiced like, our system the way it should be. So exactly. it's always uh, wrong, and, uh, and we, we've practiced it in the wrong way. Yes. But it also doesn't mean that even if we did, it, it could be, you know, it could take us to the right way. I don't know. But on the long run, it's, of course, you know, it's way better to have to live in a, in a secular state. But I doubt this will happen anytime soon. Maybe it will take another generation or two mm. to have this, you know, just settled because you can't just put the switch and just turn this because it's a whole... Like, it's a different uh, 
and a huge change in terms of culture, in terms of beliefs, yeah. in terms of everything. Um, so I think like it's going to take a lot of time, but I hope that this will be our end result or end goal or something that we push for. As long as our movement or um, like the new generation of, you know, pushing towards this uh, movement or change is always or follows some some sort of manifesto, you know, just to to know where we are heading, you know. Okay, let's say that everyone, you know, has resigned. What's our next step? Who is going to be our representative? Yep. We can't agree on small uh, issues at one point, on terminologies at one point. How are we going to, like, you know, just have this one agreement or... Um, one view over like who's going to represent us what are we what do want what do we want to do next what's the priority we, we have nothing uh, clear we don't have like a certain agenda that we want to you know just have right. this done all right we should go to the other one so i really feel like we should you know just unite in this thing at least in one thing just to know where we're heading but i really feel like even this is going to take a lot of time would it be fair to say that it's it just takes so much time for a country to even be born, for a country to figure itself out, if it doesn't figure itself out naturally. If it's born through war, if it's born through a mandate, if it's born through a UN decision, but the model is not something that just happens, it takes time. And it takes time to change it too. That it may not be wise to think of it as only outdated and inefficient, that it needs to, I, I like the way you said it, it needs to be given a chance before it's tossed out. And I worry that tossing out something like that without letting it function properly would be the wrong step. It may not be the wisest thing to jump into something that's radically different overnight. Exactly. I think we need to actually live in the historical system that we have just for once in a, t in a way that's you know that's legal that's right yes. that yes. has the right elements and we're just you know trying to fit in the right elements yeah but if we're not we didn't even do that for instance and, and you know and we we're seeing how things are evolving but this this does not come in parallel but we didn't even experience this thing right. so and why why do we want to jump there although this like perspective perspective of, you know, the end goal of a sectarian uh, division, you know, it, it could be like, something that we want to, but you know, at, at this point, we're not living in, this, in the right context that we should be. We know too many people that left in the last stretch, or they're on their way out. Could be relatives, could be friends, could be colleagues, and these tend to be one-way trips, they're not sort of in and out trying to find themselves in between. Um, we've had this conversation at times about the motive where it exists, if it exists. A line that is crossed and then you, may, you start planning. And I think, if I remember this correctly, both of us acknowledged it together. That's just not even an option. You stick as close as you can to the story you love the story that means everything. And whether or not that story takes you down, that's part of the story. I had this conversation last night or two nights ago, wandering Badaro by accident. On my way out, I meet, uh, by, I met Monica Borgman, Lukman Slim's wife. I'm walking up to go home. I run into Rawad Taha. Rawad, we love you. <laughs> we have a, I'm a huge fan of his work. <laughs> me, me too. And um, we talk about this conversation. We both sort of acknowledge it together. Oh, you stick to the story. It's what you love. Why would you leave something you love behind? And we say this knowing that, I mean, it's amazing. You're walking around empty streets. It's dark. It's eerie. It's some ways it's unsafe too, increasingly unsafe, in small ways. And uh, 
you still you don't even think about it you don't make money abroad you make less money here you uh, take a job that is not going to maybe be the most professionally rewarding abroad you take the job that makes sense to you here for me it's very clear and I was curious if you still see it this way since the last time we talked about it knowing just how painful it is to live in the story let alone share it or try to try to share it narrate it whatever this is do you have any uh, any limit honestly like I know my parents are always yeah you know, just get out of this country be safe be somewhere where you can you know be have a better life but it's I mean it's such an unconditional and genuine love that I have for Beirut that I don't even know how to express why I'm saying here, even though everything is collapsing. And I think that this is when you know that this is genuine and that even if you went out, you're not going to be happy because it's when I am speechless, although I'm, you know, I'm a very talkative person and I love to express my feelings, but it's when I have, you know, just no words and obviously we're not living, you know, we're not even living yani, <laughs> in a proper situation yeah. that I don't know why I'm still here, but I love it with, uh, with like, I would give it all my passion through my work, my, uh, you know, civil work or whatever I can do on the ground and, you know, just be around people or just look at people and know what they're doing. I just love it. And I know it's a very uh, general word to say. But it's when you can't express with concrete facts, it's when you feel that it's genuine. I completely agree. And I think uh, it wouldn't make sense to share a story you love away from the story. You want to be as close as you can to it. So I'd like to live long enough to see the change happen, not the short term, not the small change, the big change. I would like to live long enough to know that this country is improving and heading in the right direction. And I would like to live long enough to report on that. Ah. It's a, like a dream article that I want to write, <laughs> talking about, you know, the education sector in, uh, in Lebanon booming again, hospital sectors. Uh, um, maybe the best uh, doctors coming back to Lebanon, all of these you know, experts, because we're living in a like true brain drain. So honestly, you know, it would be a dream for me to talk about everyone who's coming back and, you know, have, having all the experts here and just happily living, not just uh, trying to survive day, day by day. So, And in a country that's not continuously shutting down, where you get these notifications that hospitals have to expect their patients to die because they can't even turn their lights on anymore. That's the very tragic side. And then you have places you identify with that are no longer there. Uh, people they used to see regularly that have departed. Streets that don't look the way they did at very, very recently. And scars. I don't ever turn the cameras around to show that half of my apartment is still scarred from the implosion, from the explosion. I have furniture that is imploded. True. <laughs> and I keep it private. <laughs> but that's, um, yeah, that's, it would be nice to, not nice, it's necessary at this point, to end our nightmare. True. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Talo? I spoke a lot. You spoke I think it perfectly, Sarah. Wow. I think you were very eloquent. And thank you for doing this. I really enjoyed it, although we disagreed at some points. But this is us, yeah. This is our normal conversation. We agree on a lot of things, but we, we disagree on that one thing, maybe. And I think it's a disagreement that's not born out of... Uh, it's not a right or wrong disagreement. I think it's really on how do you identify the problem the best way possible. And that, I think, there is disagreement there. But I don't think anyone with their intentions, if they're in the right place, can tolerate this machine 
the way it is. Because I'll end it. I know we <laughs> sort of ended it. I'll end it with one last question. Do you see Lebanon surviving as long as we're under Iran's? Thought? No. Me neither. But it's not, not, you know, not with the same politi politicians either. That's my ending note. <laughs> not with the same politicians either. So you, I, that is the way to flush out that disagreement, actually, right there. You see them both on the same, yeah. I still see one as preconditioned to getting rid of the others. Okay, but still, you know, it's the, the fall of both of them. The two if, entities. If the first fell and the other one stuck around, I would be so damn surprised that they would even be, that they could survive. I hope they both won't survive. And that would be the best way to, you know. And I think a lot of them would be forced to reform. Otherwise, they'd be thrown out. I don't think people have the patience to, you know, just give them this chance to, to do some reforms. Yeah, I agree. Actually, the patience is gone. And especially if we want a big change that we are calling for, then we need to, to you know, begin, begin this with ourselves, Yanni. With people yeah. who actually struggled, not with uh, people who, you know, saw, saw this from another, from another perspective. And these are, again, these are the people who we started talking about. These are the people who I saw again, in a very chill state when people were out crying their hearts out. We've tried to end it twice. I'm going to try to end it a third time. <laughs> I no, 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 no. Can you just give a little bit of a description of those meetings in Parliament? Uh, because you, as much as you'd like to say, what you see when you meet this crowd or when you observe it, it, it's uh, it's a heartbreak because they were playing around and you know and fist pumping and you know just joking around who's stronger when they fist pump and people like right across the street are dying and you know, to to you know to get some money to be able to to get their kids uh, milk or medicine and it's a life and death situation but inside the parliament or wherever they're meeting it's always like you feel like it's a, it's a la vie en rose uh, world, which is very funny. And you know, the even funnier thing is that they talk about corruption. <laughs> I mean... Do they really? Yes. They actually talk about it? All of them, yeah. All, the, all of their speeches were, were about corruption. This, you know, this thing should not be done because it's corrupt. Okay, but you know, who's signing? No. So they're even talking about it now. Yep. <laughs> It's funny if they're the ones spearheading the anti-corruption. <laughs> it's, it's really funny. I mean, I, uh, you know, the thing is that um, the UNESCO hall lo looks like a stage. Yeah, and you know, right. It is a stage well, is, and yeah. there's a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a theater. Yeah, it's a so I felt yeah. like I, I was really watching a performance. It's, mm. every, it's staged and you no, know, they're just here for entertainment. I'll end it with a thought and you can say whether or not you share it. Violence breeds vulgarity. It causes immense corruption. And it leaves us with incompetency, mediocrity, and what you're describing, which is buffoonery. It's not sectarianism that causes this. It's not negligence that causes this. But if sectarianism and negligence are in it, the worst forms of sectarianism shine, and negligence comes with the ungovernable territory that violence creates. We're not at peace, we're at war. That's how I see it. I agree. Not completely, but I agree. <laughs> Best ending <laughs> Tala, thank you. And thank you for staying with me late on a Friday night, knowing that there's nothing <laughs> better to do. <laughs> and you have just enough gas to go home. And uh, thank you for also letting me open up a bit more than I usually do on this podcast. I tend to, I don't know if it's rant, but maybe I let some of the steam off online. 
and social media. And I always catch you doing that. Yeah, you People catch me. People should know that. I always call you whenever I see like this, uh, like whenever you're having a Twitter fight, I'm just like getting my popcorn. It's a fight. It's more a, <laughs> a rebuttal. It depends with who you're in. Like it depends of the, on the context. So sometimes like, I feel like you're, yeah. you know. It depends whether or not I'm replying or quote tweeting. <laughs> Or that. <laughs> and the quote tweets, I should stop doing it unless it's important because I'm learning now that I'm, I'm late to Twitter. I'm learning that that's a more dramatic tweet than just a reply. So I'm, I'm learning. But I also get, it's funny, I get DMs, people saying, thank you for not sharing this on Twitter, that you kept this in private. I'm like, I, I do all, all of the above. But I in don't all do, forms. In all forms. I don't do it that much on the podcast. Um, but I think it's okay when it's among uh, people like you and, and people in a way that uh, are looking at it wanting the goal to be just. So that's, that's the important shared principle. There's no, there's no like a backhanded attempt here. It's just there's principles. And like you said, there are disagreements on how to get there. That's it. Thank you, Tala Ramadan. Thank you. You want to share? Thanks for listening and watching. And a friendly reminder to support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan. <laughs>